President Zelensky Morning. has come out and said he's very worried about Antonio Guterres's visit to Moscow, that he'll fall into the Kremlin's trap and that he really needs to keep his focus very much on the situation in Mariupol. How much faith do you have in the UN trip to Moscow? Well, look, I mean, I, I have some sympathy with uh, the way that President Zelensky has um, spoken about this trip. Uh, I can see the logic in his argument. Um, I think you have to uh, you know, begin with the position that the UN acts in good faith uh, and the Secretary General is seeking to uh, mediate and bring about some resolution. The order in which the visit uh, happens, I think, is probably a moot point. Um, but in the meantime, uh, it's for those of us who believe in Ukraine's right to sovereignty and the restoration of its territory to continue to support them in the way that we've been. Uh, and if the UN can uh, bring about a resolution uh, through diplomatic means, then that's to be encouraged. Uh, Armed Forces Minister, what, um, what extra are we providing to Ukraine? What's next on the provision list um, for them? They, they need artillery, uh, they need vehicles. The UK is stepping forward with that. How, how difficult is it between actually promising that and then delivering that uh, through the whole country and then providing the expertise needed to use these pieces of equipment? Got, I mean, there's lots in that, Eamon. Uh, so uh, how easy is it to get our hands on it in the first place? Well, if it's in our inventory, uh, it's pretty straightforward. If it's uh, available from industry, on the shelf, ready to go, then that's great too. Other things obviously uh, have a leads time. And so um, you know, this week alone, we are sending, uh, there's 14 armoured vehicles that have arrived. There's uh, some precision missile systems. There's 1,000 medium range uh, anti-tank weapon systems. There's 4,000 night sites. Um, so you know, that's just another week in the work of the MED. Some of that stuff we will have only decided to send last week and was ready available. Other stuff will have been weeks in gestation to get it ready to ship. Um, thereafter, obviously, there is a job of work to do with the Ukrainian armed forces to train them in how to use the systems effectively. And thus far, that's been spectacularly successful. Uh, and you know, the Ukrainian courage is, is, is amazing, but it's, uh, I know the men and women of the British Armed Forces are hugely proud to have played a part in their training. And then of course, there are supply lines within Ukraine, which now that the conflict is in the far east of Ukraine are very long supply lines indeed. And, um, but that's, that's the Ukrainian part of the puzzle. We're, we're speaking to them, we're advising them, we're helping them as much as we can. But fundamentally, it's for them to get the stuff from uh, countries in Eastern Europe across to, uh, across to the Donbass. I mean, before, before war broke out, we, we supplied people to train the Ukrainian forces in how to use certain pieces of equipment uh, that we were supplying. Do we still do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, almost everything that we are providing requires, but particularly if it's a, a weapon system, requires some degree of, of training. Uh, a lot of that is happening in Poland. Some of it is happening in the UK. There are people here training on how to operate the armoured vehicles that we are sending, and I think the next tranche of them uh, will arrive soon. Uh, in the next few weeks, Navy to Navy training will start. Um, so whether it's happening in the UK or in Poland, uh, there's lots of training activity happening. And who knows, as the situation in Western Ukraine uh, develops and becomes more stable, it may be possible to restart training in Western Ukraine as well. But that'll be a decision for the Prime Minister and the Defence Secretary once the conditions allow. Yeah, look, given that training, given the support that you've outlined that we are giving, that, you know, most people, I would say, in, in, in Britain are, are very supportive of and, and indeed proud of. You can understand why President Putin has come out and said we are at war with NATO, given that all of the support is coming from, from NATO countries. Is it just semantics or, you know, are we treading a very difficult path? Because who's to say that some of the support or the weaponry or the training that we've supplied doesn't cross over into Russian territory? Oh, just as I was finishing my question, we've lost him there, I'm afraid. We seem to have lost our link to the Armed Forces Minister there. Are we able to get him back? Is he there? He's not there. He's not, He's there. not there. That, well, you know what? We've... The, well, the money ran out in the metre. Somebody's found extra coins. I don't know, uh, Minister, if you heard all that Isabel said there. I can summarise very quickly. I'm hoping you can hear me, uh, James Heapy. Just to say, you know, could our um, ammunition, could our weapons be responsible for crossing a border into Russian territory and how dangerous a moment is that? 
don't like me speaking so honestly to GB News. So there's been some sort of cyber attack on our interview. Yeah. Who knows? Don't um, say that. But, uh, yeah, look, I think the, 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 everything that we're doing in this building and within the Foreign Office and across government is around calibration. It's about calibrating what is the right thing to do for Ukraine, given how the conflict is developing. Some of the big gear changes in UK policy and indeed policy around the rest of the donor community correlate directly to outrages that the Russians have committed within Ukraine. So Booker and Erpin was a moment when German policy noticeably changed. And Ben Wallace, my boss, made a decision to commit weapon systems uh, that we hadn't previously thought that we we would. Um, I think, though, that, uh, you asked me, I think, just before we got cut off about whether it's just semantics, to a degree, but it matters. Um, NATO is not the donor community. NATO is reinforcing the alliance's eastern flank as a defensive measure to reassure our eastern European allies. NATO is not the donor community. Some of the, many of the people in the donor community are NATO countries, but similarly, the Australians, the Kiwis, and others are part of it as well. Uh, and so it's really important that Lavrov and Putin, and as much if, as they if, want... If Putin's to... not at war with NATO, semantically, and, and, and we are the suppliers, is he at war with us? Well, I mean, I don't think that you would paint it that way. I think there are lots of examples of where uh, equipment that has been manufactured by one country but yeah. fired by another... You don't, right. you, don't, you don't count okay. the manufacturers, but, the equipment so as the villagers. This, though. Let me ask you this. Uh, Isabel was talking about the country, uh, our country, uh, being in support, supportive of, of what you as a government are doing there generally. With one exception, I am just sensing, I don't know what you make of this, Isabel, a sort of change in tone. So, so, so far, we have what, like, put about half a billion pounds uh, worth of uh, equipment and whatever into Ukraine. And we're getting... A growing number of emails and tweets and things saying, look, we've got a cost of living crisis here, we've got an energy crisis here, we've got a living wage crisis here. Why can't you spend that money back at home? It's just, it's, it's creeping in, it's growing a bit more. What would you say to people who are saying, spend it on us, not on Ukraine? <laughs> I would say that I understand their concerns, and I think that there is no doubt that the top priority right now of the British people is the cost of living and the, the, the way that their monthly bills are getting bigger and the challenges that creates. What, what I'd say, though, is that, you know, what price freedom? And it is you know, the, the way that Putin's Russia over the last 20 years has become ever more belligerent within the Euro-Atlantic has uh, leveraged its uh, energy supplies uh, to achieve geopolitical effects within Europe uh, are things that at some point the West was going to need to draw a line and say enough's enough. We need to reverse our energy dependency. That's not inexpensive. We need to stand up for a rules-based international system within the Euro-Atlantic. That's not inexpensive. But the consequence of doing that is that we can get to a place where I think we can live in a much safer, more stable, uh, and uh, less dependent uh, Europe. Uh, and I think that that is a good thing. Now, and I, I hope that your viewers agree. And I, I appreciate that when you're looking at bills that you're struggling to afford, that's rather, you know, your, your instinct is to say, well, yeah, but I, I, we just can't afford it. But I think we have to, we, because it is, you know, what is at stake is, yes, the freedom of a sovereign country, but so too 20, 30 years of security threat within the Euro-Atlantic that is a direct challenge to our national security. Uh, and look, a final uh, question from me, uh, and this is, um, you know, you asked the question, what price freedom? And I just want to bring in the whole debate about Angela Rayner and the Mail on Sunday article, the editor being hauled in by uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Lindsay Hoyle. Just wonder what your own personal view is on that, because certainly us in the media industry, we're affronted by that. We see that as a threat to free, free press, and that is a, a worrying precedent that could be set. Do you think that it is right that the Speaker should be hauling in the editor of the Mail on Sunday over something? However, abhorrent the views may be? Well, I mean, the Speaker is rightly uh, independent of government, and so it's, 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 I don't think he would thank the government spokesman of the day to, to sort of um, speak for him. Though? 
Well, my, 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 so my personal view is that if the threat was around removing the rights of that journalist to be in Parliament and report on Parliament, I would be uh, I would be similarly affronted. But I do think that uh, my female colleagues across the House on all parties, they have to live with the reality every single day that it is not about what they say and do in the service of our country through their work in Parliament. Too often it's about what they look like, what they wear and whatever else. And I think that the speaker just reminding journalists that our public discourse, our democracy is better for having large numbers of women serving in Parliament. Hopefully we'll get to a point soon where Parliament is 50-50. And that is a good thing and that women will be put off getting into roles in public life, if again and again and again, what they wear, what they look like, how they behave is judged in an entirely different way to the way that it is for men. And I think if that's the point that Lindsay is making, then it's a point that's very necessary and will be very well made. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.